Before we delve into this chilling tale, I urge you to support my channel by subscribing and clicking on the bell. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you, the case of Matthew Winkler, Secrets of a Religious Family. Sometimes the most horrible and unpredictable crimes are committed in seemingly perfect families. Of course, even in the most prosperous unit of society, crises can emerge unnoticed by others, but they can literally poison the lives of all family members and eventually lead to tragedy. The Winklers in the town of Selmer were considered by many to be a model family. The young pastor, his wife, and their three daughters looked happy, had everything they needed for a comfortable life, were healthy and successful. But in a quiet pool, as they say in this case, many questions remained unanswered because we heard only one version of what happened, and the story itself became the subject of the book Sex and Murder, Secrets of a Pastor. March 22, 2006, the small town of Selmer, Tennessee, shook with terrible news. A 31-year-old pastor named Matthew Winkler was brutally murdered in his own home, and his wife Mary and their three daughters, 8-year-old Patricia, 6-year-old Maria Eliza, and 1-year-old Brianna, disappeared without a trace. That day, the preacher of the Church of Christ did not show up for the evening service where he was supposed to attend with his family. This circumstance seemed strange and suspicious because Matthew was always very responsible and could not miss the planned event without informing anyone. None of the family members also answered the phone, which was even more disturbing. Alarmed community members decided to go to the Winkler's residence to find out what had happened and if they needed help from the outside. The house looked normal. Windows and doors intact and nothing suspicious visible inside. Lights were on in several rooms and a television played loudly in one of the rooms, giving the impression that the owners of the house were busy doing their own thing. The front door was locked, but no one answered the knocks. Phone calls also went unanswered. Through the curtained windows, it was impossible to see what was going on inside or if anyone was there. However, even though the whole situation was quite strange, no one was in a hurry to call the police. Instead, a call was made to an elder of the religious community who advised them to look for a spare key and open the door themselves. It took another hour and a half, and when community members were finally able to get inside the house, they found an eerie scene. Everything in the house was in its place, no sign of intruders, but the owners were nowhere to be seen. Everything seemed normal until the visitors looked into the marital bedroom. There on the floor, in a pool of his own blood, lay the pastor's body, Matthew Winkler. He had a huge hole in his back from a gunshot wound, blood spattered everywhere and bloody foam dried on his face. By then, the body had already cooled and stiffened, indicating that Matthew had been lying there for many hours and had probably been killed in the morning because he was dressed in his pajamas. It was only after this gruesome discovery that a call was made to the police. By the time the police arrived, a whole crowd of neighbors, churchgoers, and casual passers-by had gathered in and around the house, interested in what was going on. All these people had left their fingerprints at the crime scene, erasing or trampling possible evidence and greatly complicating the work of investigators. The police took the body for forensic examination and found that the pastor was killed by a single shot in the back, fired from a large-caliber weapon. He died a few minutes after the wound from massive blood loss, unable to call for help. It was simply impossible to definitively establish whether there were any strangers in the house at that time because the people who had arrived before the police arrived had literally destroyed all traces of them. The picture of the crime was quite strange, and those who could shed any light on what happened disappeared. The fate of the wife and daughters of the murdered man remained unknown. The police assumed that the woman and children could have been kidnapped or also killed. By the way, the family minivan, Winkler's vehicle, also disappeared from the garage, launching a massive search. A yellow alert was issued by the state, indicating that children were missing and all citizens were asked to be vigilant and assist in the search. But let's break down this whole story from the beginning. Matthew Brian Winkler was born in 1974 on November 21st in the picturesque country town of Henderson, Tennessee. He was the youngest of three sons of Dan and Diane Winkler. Our hero and his two older brothers, James and Daniel, grew up in a rather conservative Christian family. Their parents were very religious and brought up their sons in strictness and obedience. Matthew became a minister of the church in the fifth generation. His father, great-uncle Michael, grandfather Wendell, 
great-grandfather Merlin Winkler and great-great-grandfather Merlin Paul Winkler Sr. were all preachers of the gospel at one time. To top it all off, the father ran the local preacher's school and was a man respected and influential in his hometown. In their younger years, the Winkler brothers attended Sunday school and were active in church activities. In addition to church involvement, Matthew, in high school, was seriously interested in soccer. Everyone who saw his game on the field noted that he had talent and could well become an outstanding athlete of world renown. However, later, the young man decided to sacrifice a promising sports career in favor of Bible study and church ministry. Since the preaching activity of the head of the family was associated with frequent travel, his wife and children almost always followed him. Because of this, Matthew changed several schools in his childhood, but the active, communicative, and friendly child quickly made friends and gained authority everywhere. When the boy finished school, his family lived in a small city called Austin, located in the state of Texas. Matthew was a creative person with powerful charisma, but his outstanding achievements in studies were not notable. After graduating from high school, he entered the college Fried Hardeman and successfully completed it. In parallel, the young man began to try his hand as a pastor under the careful guidance of his father. Matthew was the youth minister of the Central Church of Christ in the city of McMinnville. He was later appointed to the preaching position at the Fourth Street Church of Christ in Selmer, Tennessee. Mary Carol Winkler, maiden named Freeman, was born in December 1973 in G Township, Tennessee, and was the oldest of two daughters to her parents. She was also raised in a deeply religious family with strict rules. The head of the family for many years served as a pastor in the Christian church, where the girl attended Sunday school. A few years later, a second daughter was born to the family and named Patricia. Unfortunately, the girl was born prematurely and had a number of serious health problems, including cerebral palsy, seizures, epilepsy, and mental retardation. For many years, the parents did not want to accept the disappointing diagnoses of the child and desperately tried to treat her, agreeing even to experimental therapy. However, it did not bring any particular improvement. Mary tenderly loved her little sister, always treated her with awe. The tragic tale of Matthew Winkler comes to an unsettling conclusion as the legal proceedings unfold, revealing a complex web of familial dysfunction, abuse, and a shocking act of violence. Mary Winkler, the wife of Matthew, was ultimately convicted of involuntary manslaughter for fatally shooting her husband. Throughout the court proceedings, Mary presented a narrative of enduring years of emotional and physical abuse at the hands of Matthew. She described him as a domineering figure, demanding obedience and subjecting her to humiliating and unacceptable forms of intimacy. Mary's defense painted a picture of a woman pushed to her limits, facing prolonged suffering and finally succumbing to a moment of despair. The court seemed to acknowledge the influence of domestic abuse in Mary's actions, leading to a conviction that fell short of a more severe charge. Despite Mary's conviction, the legal system also recognized the complexity of her mental state. She spent time in a psychiatric hospital for evaluation, where experts assessed whether she posed a danger to herself or others. This evaluation likely influenced the final sentencing, which resulted in Mary serving less than a year in prison. The aftermath of the trial stirred controversy and mixed emotions. Matthew's parents were devastated by the perceived lack of justice for their son. They believed that Mary deliberately took his life and received minimal punishment, which left them grieving and frustrated. Furthermore, the custody battle over the couple's daughters added another layer of heartbreak. In a surprising turn, Mary was granted sole custody of the children after a brief stint in prison and psychiatric evaluation. Matthew's parents, alarmed and distressed, contested this decision, asserting that Mary should not have custody due to her involvement in their son's death. The legal resolution left a community divided and grappling with the complexities of domestic turmoil, mental health, and justice. Mary Winkler, having served a comparatively short sentence, regained custody of her daughters while Matthew's parents were left to reconcile with the loss of their son and the unsettling outcome of the legal proceedings. The Matthew Winkler case remains a haunting reminder of the intricate nature of familial relationships, the consequences of unchecked abuse, and the challenges faced by the legal system in navigating such emotionally charged and morally ambiguous situations.